So finally, we've come to the Academic Foundation Programme. I know, I'm sorry, I kept you waiting. Unless you're smart and you just jumped to this timestamp. But anyway, so what is the Academic Foundation Programme? Well, basically, it's a type of foundation programme that allows you to explore your interest in research or teaching or leadership. Now, some places separate them very distinctly into these three categories. So if you're applying for an AFP, it might be delineated as specifically a teaching AFP. But some places are a bit more fluid and they're kind of more general. Now, it's very important for me to highlight that not all AFPs are created equal. The same way I'm always like, not all deaneries are created equal, not all AFPs are the same. So it's really important to do your research beforehand because the programmes can vary so much between deaneries terms of the kinds of things you'd be doing on your academic block, how that academic block is even structured throughout the two years, and there can even be differences on a trust level as well. So I'll go into exactly the things that I looked into before I applied later on in the video. But first let's talk a little bit about what the programme is. So it's part of the Integrated Academic Training Pathway. Now this is a flowchart I would really recommend you get familiar with because you're going to see it a lot <laughs> and you may in fact get asked about it at the interview. The structure of this is it starts with an academic foundation programme, then it goes into an academic clinical fellowship or an ACF. That's kind of the equivalent of like a core training or GP training thing. And then that moves into academic clinical lectureships, senior lectureships, so on and so forth. So this pathway was developed as kind of an equivalent to other types of specialty training or run-through training, but you don't have to start right at the beginning to be able to do all of these posts. You can kind of hop on and hop off as you please, which sounds very odd and sounds super easy, like I'm just saying like, oh, you can get on the bus, like, all aboard the academic train. I assure you it's probably more difficult than that. But essentially what that means is that if you are interested in academics, you don't have to do an academic foundation program to be able to then go on to do other academic roles. And similarly, just because you do an academic foundation program, it doesn't mean that you have to become an academic. So unfortunately, in reality, these posts can be quite competitive. And someone explained it to me really well, which was that it's kind of like a pyramid. So at the bottom, you've got your AFP and there aren't that many AFPs if you compare them to the number of foundation jobs that are available but in relation to the other types of academic jobs there are quite a lot of AFPs. Then you go one step higher, you go to the ACFs where there's less of them and they become a bit more competitive and then you go even higher to ACLs and senior lectureships. It just keeps getting smaller and smaller and more and more competitive and there are less and less jobs available. So unfortunately yes they can be super competitive later on but the good news is you don't have to worry about that right now because in reality the only people that are going to follow that entire pathway are people that are super into academia and you don't need to know that right now so that's totally fine. I think for most of us we've just done a little bit of research or maybe no research at all and we just want to find out more about what this is and what academic life could be like and that's a totally valid reason for wanting to do an academic foundation program and that's one of the great things about the AFP it's not trying to be let's make you into a professor today. It's let's guide you along this path. Let's tell you more about what it's like to be an academic. Let's see if this is something that you're actually interested in. Let's give you some really good transferable skills and a good foundation in research skills so that then you choose to use that how you please. So one really big myth that people often hold about AFP is that you have to be dead set on academics or you have to know that you want to be a professor to be able to do the AFP. And that's so not true. I remember being told by someone that you don't even need formal research experience to apply because the best thing that you can show them is that you want to learn and that you're interested and that you're keen. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on as to how this translates when you're actually looking at the application. But that's definitely one thing that I think is very important is not to get discouraged by a lack of publications but keep watching and I'll convince you that you do not need loads of publications or presentations to be able to do well. So we'll move on to talking about the structure and how this differs from the standard foundation program. So as you might know the standard foundation program has three rotations of four months each in each year so you have a total of six rotations whereas the AFP is a little bit different. So there are two main structures to AFP that you need to know about. There's the day release and there's the academic block. So academic block just means in your foundation two year, instead of having three clinical rotations, one of those rotations just gets bumped by an academic rotation. And in this academic block, you don't have clinical duties, 
you're just spending your time focusing on your academic projects. Now, day release means that instead of one whole chunk of four months being taken out to do academia, you have it sort of spread over those two years. So often it's one day a week allocated to academics over the course of the two years. So you're kind of constantly getting this protected academic time over the two years, instead of having it all in one bunch in your second year. Now some places like to kind of switch it up and do like a combination of these. And so again, not all AFPs are created equal and not all deaneries are the same. So it's really important to look into what structure each deanery is offering. So for example, the Northern Foundation School, which is Newcastle, they have two academic blocks, which is really great if you're super keen. So they get two four month blocks one is in foundation year one and one is in foundation year two. So that's why I say again, it's so important to look into each specific deanery because they can vary quite a lot. So let's talk through the pros and cons of each type. Now the academic block gives you more continuity in your work. So you're able to do the same thing day in and day out for four months. So you can find your flow with your work. It'll make you more productive. You're not going to have any other clinical duties. So you know, you're not going to be tired from doing nights or on calls. You can just fully focus on this project and use your time really, really well. Now, this is especially useful if you're planning on doing something like a laboratory project or some regular teaching for medical students, for example, because you'll be able to do it every single day for those four months. It also allows you to plan well in advance. So you can use your whole F1 year to plan out your academic block so that when it begins in F2, you really hit the ground running. Now this could be a pro or a con, depending on how organized you are. Now the cons are that you get a whole chunk of time away from clinical practice which again could be a pro or a con depending on how you want to look at it. But one thing that trainees often say is that they feel they kind of become a bit de-skilled during this time and that actually when they come back to doing a clinical job in F2, you've not only got the step up of being an F2 with more responsibility than an F1, you've also got to deal with the fact that you've had some time away and therefore it'll take you a bit of time to get back into the swing of things. Now a way around that is that some people do the odd locum shift on like weekends and things like that. So kind of keep up their skills and also earn some extra cash money on the side. So that kind of brings me on to my next point, which is finances. Um, when you're working on an academic job, your hours are going to be strictly Monday to Friday, nine to five. Like I said, you've not got any on calls or any nights. And so you're just getting the standard base pay. You're not going to get any of the like unsociable hours type pay. So you will find that you have a bit of a pay cut during those four months that you're on academics. So practically what this means is that your monthly pay could be reduced by a few hundred pounds depending on what specialty you're on before this. So it is a significant amount of money, so something to think about. So with the day release structure, it can be really great to give you some variety in your working week. And it's something that's a little bit closer to what life as a clinical academic would be like once you get to that consultant level. It gives you allocated time to plan your project because you've got that time during F1 as well. So it's likely that you'll spend less of your own time on your evenings and your weekends planning your project and working towards it. Because the other thing to think about as with all research, you're going to have to apply for funding, apply for approvals, all that sort of thing, well in advance to actually starting the project. And so there is a lot of groundwork that has to be done before you can get stuck in to doing the things you want to be doing. Another benefit of the day release structure is that you won't have a break from clinical practice. And depending on the structure of the program where you're applying to, you might actually be able to experience six different clinical rotations instead of like in the academic block format where you only get five clinical rotation because one has been overthrown by the academic rotation. So that's something to consider if you're interested in exploring quite a few different clinical specialties, you've maybe not quite made up your mind yet or you've got quite a few that you really want to get a good foundation training in. The day release structure may be able to offer you more clinical exposure than the academic block. Now cons to the day release structure are that right from the beginning, the clock is ticking on your academic time and so you have to really get stuck in and make the most of every single day that you have this day release. And ideally you'd probably need to spend some time before F1 begins planning and making a bit of a game plan. Now this seems like a good point at which to kind of pause and just say that there are some factual differences in the application between AFP and Standard Foundation Program. So to start with, the deaneries for AFP are not just called deaneries, nor are they called deaneries in the Standard Foundation Program because people just like to make things confusing. But anyway, so in the Standard Foundation Program, deaneries are called units of application. But in the Academic Foundation Program, deaneries are called academic units of application. 
Don't ask me why. So these academic units of application or deaneries, I'm just going to call them deaneries, are slightly different to the standard foundation deaneries that you're going to apply to. So oftentimes they can be like a combination of surrounding standard foundation program deaneries and so they can often cover a larger geographical area. So for example, East Midlands is the name of the academic foundation program deanery you would apply for, but actually it consists of hospitals that are under both the Trent deanery and the LNR or Leicester Northampton Rutland deanery. So similarly, if you're interested in applying to London, there's the London and South East Academic Deanery versus all the different ones that that region is split up into for Standard Foundation Programme. And another way in which the AFP is different to the Standard Foundation Programme, which is something that I mentioned in my Standard Foundation Programme video as well, is that you can only apply to two academic deaneries or two academic units of application. So that's why it's even more important to choose smartly and we'll come on to how to choose and maximise your chances in a little bit. So there's a list of all the academic deaneries with their competition ratios and I don't know why it was kind of a difficult document to find, like UKFPO ain't making this easy man, they, we have to dig, we have to dig. But anyway, so I've linked that in the description below so you can get an idea of the competition ratios for different deaneries. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the one for this year, but hopefully things won't have differed too much. So I've kind of told you about what AFP is, how it's different to foundation program. So let's talk a little bit about why you should do it or should not do it. So one thing to consider is time for research versus the extra clinical exposure. So you don't have to do an AFP to do research or to do teaching or to be involved in quality improvement stuff. You can always do these things in your own time on the side just by getting in touch with people you're working with or departments that you're interested in. But the benefit of the academic foundation program is that you have this protected academic time. And that is a really key word that you should really make sure to think about using in your white space questions or in the interview if they do ask you why you want to do it because it's kind of like its whole thing um so you kind of need to say that that's why you want to do it so anyway with this protected academic time you know you're not going to be distracted by nights by on calls by any other clinical duties you can really focus on it and you're actually going to be getting paid to do just that so some people would rather not go through the whole hassle of doing this extra application process and they'd rather just do research and teaching on the side as and when they want, not have it so formalized. So a really big question that you should ask yourself is do I want protected academic time? So number two is competition and studying for finals. Now, every medical school's finals are gonna happen at a different time, right? But around the time AFP interviews happen is like crunch time for most people in terms of prep for finals. So everyone's either buckling down or we've already gone into hermit mode. Or some people I remember when I met them at interview, they had their finals like literally the week after. And of course, passing finals is more important than any job, right? I mean, you can't work as a doctor if you haven't passed medical school. But something to think about is how much time Time you're willing to allocate to this application process because the time that you allocate to this process is time that you could be studying for finals instead and I understand that this is dependent upon when in the year your finals are but it is worth noting that this process is quite long and it does take a significant amount of time if you really want to maximize your chances and so assessing where you're at in terms of finals preparation is also very valuable. That being said by applying for the AFP the only thing you have to lose is time and effort really because you submit a standard foundation program program application before you can submit an AFP. So you've always got that in the background. And if you don't get an AFP offer or you choose to decline it, then you just get put back into the standard foundation program application just like nothing even happened. So the question you have to ask yourself here is, do I want to sacrifice some finals revision time for an AFP. Now the three is availability. So there are much fewer academic jobs than standard foundation jobs, which means that there may not be academic jobs available in the hospitals or in the specific locations that you're looking to go to, and they may not be in the specific departments that you're interested in. There may also be limited academic options if you're really set on some specific clinical rotations. Like for example, if you really wanted to do dermatology or ophthalmology, or ones that aren't so common in every single job combination, you may find it quite difficult to find an academic foundation program job that also gives you that very specific clinical rotation combination. So question for you, how important is location and job combination versus having that protected academic time? So number four is making the most of it. Having an AFP looks really great on your CV, but there is no point having had all of that protected academic time to do research or teaching if you didn't actually do anything with it. 
So if you spent your entire academic block waiting for ethical approval on a project that you didn't really get to contribute to, that's not going to look that great when you go to specialty interview and they ask you what you did with your AFP. Whereas someone who's done the standard foundation program could have done an audit or two, presented it somewhere, and they'll still have a lot more to talk about in terms of their research and academic experience than you did having done an AFP. So the advice that I always got was that making the most of an AFP is a lot more important than just doing one. And when it comes to core or specialty training applications, you need to be able to talk about what you actually achieved during this time. Because if you don't, it could work against you instead of working for you because you actually had all of this time allocated for it and you didn't do anything with it. Number five is SJT. <laughs> and specifically, it's no SJT bringing you down versus SJT bringing you up. Now, I know I've spoken about the SJT being kind of luck-based before, but one really great thing I think about the Academic Foundation Programme is that your offer is not based upon an SJT score. You only have to have gotten a satisfactory score, which just means as long as you didn't do terribly badly on the SJT and get like the lowest score ever, you should be fine. Just remember that the average score is 40 out of 50, so there's quite a small range either side of that really that people get their marks in. So most people tend to do pretty okay. However, a point to think about is that if your EPM or educational performance measure, I explained what that is in the standard foundation program video, it basically is a combination of your decile among other things. If that's not that high, then the SJT can be a really great way to pull your total score up and get you into the deanery that you want. Unfortunately, the only problem is that you don't know your SJT score until after you get a standard foundation program allocation. And so by this point, you'll have already had to apply, give interviews for, and you'll already have got any AFP offers. So it's a point to consider whether or not you think the SJT score will boost your application or what it might bring it down. So number six is the scoring for academic foundation programs. So the scoring for AFP is different to the standard foundation program. As you noticed, I've already said that it doesn't include your SJT score. So apart from your medical school decile, the score for AFP has a lot of additional things that count towards your mark. So there's something called white space questions. So just pop a pin in that, I will come back to them and talk about them in a bit more detail. But aside from that, there's up to two additional degrees. There's up to 10 publications. Now I know this sounds very daunting. You're like, who even has 10 publications? I had none, okay? I had no publications. I still don't have any publications. Not that I would have acquired some in the few months after finals, but you know, the reason why they give you up to 10 is because they don't have to be PubMed ID papers. So in the standard foundation program, you can list up to two publications, but they have to have a PubMed ID. With this one, they don't have to have a PubMed ID. You can also get up to 10 points for presentations. So they can be either you doing the presentation or someone else presenting your work as long as you're credited as an author, if it's like a poster or something like that. And these presentations can be either oral presentations or poster presentations. You can also list up to 10 prizes or distinctions or merits. So they can be things like if you got a prize for doing well during your medical school degree, or if you presented at a conference and you got a prize because of that. It could also be if you got a distinction class in some modules during medical school. And so the lines for what counts and what doesn't can blur quite a bit depending on which deanery you're looking at and it's not always explicitly said what they count and what they don't count so my advice would be to put down as many things as you can that you think could be accepted obviously i'm not saying you know go and write that you got a prize in year five swimming or something that's clearly not relevant but anything that you think could be deemed to be relevant and could be accepted as having a point for you should put down because you never know if you do put it down and they don't want to count it you're not going to lose anything and it's not going to be counted against you but if you don't put it you don't get it some deaneries are great about this and they publish applicant guidance about what counts and what doesn't when you're applying for them so i've linked the west midlands and northern ones as examples in the description but each deanery can vary quite a lot some of them don't publish this guidance unfortunately and therefore it's nice to have ones like this as a bit of a guideline but like I said even if one deanery says they're going to count something and one deanery doesn't specifically say they're not going to count it I would put it for both so for example if you got a distinction in a particular module during medical school say it was like a communication skills module for example 
That's the only one I ever got a distinction in. So you can put that down as one of your distinctions. And some deaneries might choose to accept that, some might not, but I just put it for both that I applied for. And I don't know if it got counted or not, but if I hadn't put it, it definitely wouldn't have gotten counted. It's not like I had a lot of other prizes or anything, so every little bit counts, right? So this all seems kind of daunting, right? You're like, who has 10 presentations and 10 publications and tons of prizes and X, Y, and Z? Don't freak out. If I hope you take anything away from this video, it's this. Do not let a lack of presentations or publications or a high decile stop you from applying for the AFP. Look, we can be honest. Yes, you might not get into a London AFP or a Cambridge or an Oxford AFP, but there are plenty of other deaneries out there that you could get into if you apply smartly. That's why I keep mentioning you have to play to your strengths and you have to really have researched this really, really well so that you know exactly where you can place your bets. Because yes, you may not have these things, but there are so many other strengths to your application that I'm sure you have that you can highlight and use to build you up. So for example, if you know you've not got a very high decile and you've not got a lot of these points, you can use the white space questions, told you I'd come back to them, you can use the white space questions to really build up your application and show them that you've done a lot outside of just these numbers and just these figures. It's not about choosing the person with the most research experience or the most publications. It's about choosing the person with the most potential. So if you can show them that you're interested in research, you're clinically competent, you have a vision for your career, that can be seen as a lot more valuable than just a PubMed ID.